All right, welcome. Looks like we have a full house. Who would have thought that the uh, sponsored solutions track could pack a room? This is excellent. So uh, our goal today is spark a coding joyride. And what does that mean? Well, our goal today is number one, to showcase Spark's ability to process big data. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a straightforward example. We're going to extract information using an RDD. We'll just read a file and do standard RDD style programming. We'll talk about what an RDD is as well. We'll then demonstrate some of the higher level APIs. For example, the Data Frames API, which in Spark 1.6 has substantial performance improvements over what we used to be able to do with RDDs. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll then do some visualization so that we can start extracting patterns and doing exploratory data analysis. And we'll even create a simple machine learning pipeline to create a model that can do predictive analytics based on our data so that we can then begin predicting future outcomes based on past data points. And along the way, I really hope to give you a sense under the hood of some of the things that make Spark 10 to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce. So that's our goal for today. Before we get started, I thought I'd introduce myself. So my name is Doug Bateman. I'm the director of training at New Circle. New Circle is a Databricks partner. We have uh, partnered up with Databricks to help provide their entire training curriculum and catalog. I've been working with Java back since 1995, so that was Java 1.0, if anybody remembers. I always thought it was funny back then. You'd see job postings for five years' experience with Java, and of course, this is Java 1.0. But I've been working as a software architect as well as trainer during this period of time. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. These are some of the projects I worked on, including Microsoft Azure. I've been working on uh, various Android applications in development. And we also do training at New Circle on HTML, Spark, Java, and Python. And I work in all these areas as well. But I'm more than just a professional guy. I also like to have fun. So uh, given that we're on the West Coast here, I always like to break the ice a little bit. So here's a picture of me uh, sailing. This was up in Vancouver, Canada. I recently moved down here to San Francisco. So uh, one of my hobbies is sailing. I also enjoy a little bit of rock climbing. I picked that up from my wife. We're actually expecting our first child in March. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, before we go any further, I wanted to just quickly poll the audience, because one of the things you just don't know coming into a presentation is what type of audience to expect. So first of all, oops, there should be. How many of you guys are new to Spark? Excellent. How many of you guys have used Spark hands-on? At least a little. OK, and how many of you guys have more than one year of experience on Spark? Excellent, OK. So for the audio, that was almost the entire room was new to Spark. So this is perfect, and I will aim the presentation towards that. So when we talk about Spark, the first thing we want to understand is its goal. A unified engine across data sources, workloads, and environments. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail here. So first of all, we have a unified engine. So Spark Core is really the hub of Spark, and it uses this ingenious in-memory abstraction known as a resilient distributed data set. So though, how many of you guys are familiar with Hadoop? All right, so we got a lot of Hadoop guys in here. Excellent. So in Hadoop, you guys are very familiar. We do a map operation. We write back to disk. We do a reduce operation. We write back to disk. And typically, we're using the Hadoop file system, HDFS, to do these operations. And one of the big reasons we write to disk is because you're doing a big job. And you don't want to lose your entire job in the event that a single machine were to fail. Now, with the resilient distributed data set, Spark Core allows us to do the same type of thing, but in memory. And so it's a very different runtime architecture. And we'll look at it in just a little bit later. But that's Spark Core. Now, dealing with Spark Core is very much functional programming. You're doing MapReduce type operations. We'd like to have a much higher level API. And so built on top of Spark Core are four primary engines. 
First of all, Spark SQL, which has both a programming API where you express your queries using what are known as data frames, or a raw SQL API. And this actually uses an underlying query optimizer to rewrite your optimization, your query, to run on top of RDDs, but much, much faster. It's capable of pushing down parts of the query down to the database so that the filters are done on the underlying data source or parquet file rather than in the MapReduce operation. It's also capable of offloading work into native memory to achieve far more memory density than you get with ordinary Java objects. Just to give you an idea, a string in Java is encoded as a Unicode value, UTF-16. Plus, it's got a length field and a hash code field. And overall, a very short string may be up to 64 bytes or longer, 64 words, I should say. Whereas if you compare that to what you can do natively in memory, I could fit quite a bit of information with just one byte per character, much more efficiently. And when you're dealing with in-memory operations, that matters. So this gets optimized with native memory and performs faster. We then have things like Spark Streaming, which allows us to do micro batch jobs on top of Spark that would allow us to actually process streaming data very much the way you might process it on something like Apache Storm but with the compute power of the Spark engine. We've got MLlib. MLlib is typically used by data scientists, and what it's capable of doing is training mathematical models based on very large data sets. How many people here have a data science background? Okay, a few of you guys in here, very good. So this is MLlib. We can do linear regression, we can do k-means algorithms, classification. Machine learning is really the future of computation in many ways. Given enough information, we can learn about anything. Google learns which emails you consider important. We can learn which websites typically are associated with spam, which web pages are more likely to contain the information you need. Facebook learns which friends are more likely to be set trendsetters. You can analyze networks to figure out which people are really leading the industry in terms of new announcements that everybody else follows and retweets. And then lastly, well, I just kind of spoiled GraphX. This last one where I talked about analyzing these types of networks is the engine GraphX, which is really vertice edge databases. So these are the four engines on top of Spark that are built on top of Spark Core, which is basically a much faster compute model than what you get with Spark MapReduce. Those of you, how many of you have worked with Hive? So you may be slightly familiar with the capabilities of Spark SQL. Spark SQL, in fact, uses the Hive query language, but it uses the Spark runtime. And it's capable of connecting to your existing Hive tables. So built on top of Spark Core, we have both the RDD API, that's that resilient distributed data set that does functional programming, and what is known as the Data Frames API, which is a much easier and simple API for processing big data. And I'm going to showcase both of those today. And then I talk about Spark spanning many data sources. So Spark can pull its data from Postgres SQL or MySQL or really any data source that offers a JDBC connector. We can also pull our data in for Cassandra or HBase, Hadoop HDFS, Amazon EC2. We can read in JSON files. We can use Elasticsearch, Parquet files, which is a very efficient Hadoop-based file format for reading database tables. So we can connect to a whole ecosystem of different data sources, process it on Spark Core, and the beauty here is that we can then deploy this into many different types of environments. So at Databricks, we like to use Amazon EC2 so that you can quickly launch your application and say, you know what, I need 100 computers, but I only need them right now. And you know what, I want to run on Spark 1.6. I don't want to wait six to seven months for my vendor to update to 1.6 and then have my IT team install it, because 1.6 has all this off-memory heap stuff. So basically, by running inside of the cloud, the idea at Databricks is that you can always be using the latest and greatest of Spark and still connect to any of your data sources. But the engine runs in the cloud, you quickly bring up the machines when you need them, you shut them down when you don't. None of this, I think I need 100 machines and I need to order them and then have IT set them up before I've done any type of benchmarking. 
Now, just to give you an idea of the success of Spark, Spark is a 100% open source Apache project, and it's used in production today in over 500 organizations, from big Fortune 100 to really small shops. And this is just a list of some of the companies that are using Apache Spark today. And the list is growing. So if you're wondering, is Spark real? Is it going to go the distance? The answer is absolutely. It already is. So just to give you an idea about the activity going on, commits in the past year. Hadoop MapReduce is fairly mature. Not that much change to core Hadoop MapReduce. Yarn, which is a big scheduling application that allows us to basically manage resources in a cluster. Quite a bit of work done. HDFS, Spark very much embraces, a, embraces HDFS. HDFS is not going away anytime soon. Then we have Apache Storm, which is a big streaming engine. But look on top of all of that, the activity going on, Spark is very much an active project. To give you an idea of scale, the largest publicly acknowledged cluster in the world is Tencent in China with over 8,000 nodes. The largest publicly acknowledged single job is Alibaba, which processes a petabyte of data. And as you see later on, Spark off Databricks running Spark also won the terabyte sort competition. And after they finished clobbering Hadoop in the terabyte sort competition, went on to process a petabyte of data just for fun. It's also got very high streaming throughput, so a terabyte of data per hour at Janila uh, Farm. And as I mentioned, in 2004, it got the world record for sorting 100 terabytes of data. So let's look at that world record here. So 2013, Hadoop has the world record for sorting 100 terabytes of data. They create a custom cluster of over 2,100 machines, and they're able to, very impressive, sort 100 terabytes of data in 72 minutes. 2014, Spark comes along with only 200 machines running inside of Amazon EC2. Spark sorts the same amount of data in 23 minutes, and then goes on to sort a terabyte of data in 10 times that, 230 minutes. For a petabyte of data, I'm sorry, a petabyte of data in 230 minutes, same resources. Truly impressive results in terms of scalability and throughput. Spark is saturating the capabilities of the underlying hardware. Now, how does Spark really work? Let's look at some of the terminology here. So when you start getting used to Spark and you start working with Spark, the first thing you want to be aware of is when you launch your application, you're launching a driver. It can either be a shell, which we'll be using today, or it can actually be a standalone program. And that driver will reach out to whatever resource manager you're using, it can be Yarn, to acquire several machines, and they can be executors, in this, or these will become our executors. And what's going to happen is the driver's going to break up our work and farm it out to these executor machines. Now, this is very different than what you saw in Hadoop, because these executors are going to be living for the lifetime of our application, which allows us to cache our data in memory. So we'll farm out these individual tasks that will be processing what we call partitions of data on each of these outlier machines. So the executors are the workhorse. The driver is the director. It drives the process. It is our application. And for the duration of the application, which may be many jobs, these executors will remain up, which is very different than what you would see with Hadoop, where the processes are short-lived for an individual operation. Now, to get us going here, let me make sure I, oh, before I uh, get into my demo, I wanted to introduce one of the key abstractions. So I'm going to pull up just some of our courseware from our Spark training with New Circle and Databricks. So we talked about this idea of Spark Core really being RDDs, or Resilient Distributed Data Sets. So let's look at how this compute model works and why it beats Hadoop. In Hadoop MapReduce, specifically, in terms of performance. So let's say I've got my data in HDFS. In Spark, what I'm going to do is, first of all, read that data into what we call a resilient distributed data set. These will be partitioned out, 
Different executors will page in the partitions that they need to do their job. But initially, when I define this RDD, nothing gets loaded immediately. It's done lazily. So you'll see this dotted line. Nothing's in memory just yet. I then start defining my computing processing pipeline. So for example, I might do a filter transformation. So here we have a log file, log data, and I just want to filter out the errors. Those of you who have worked with Hadoop are going to be familiar with this typical map operation. Or in this case, it's a filter operation. I'm just filtering out only error messages. Now you see this little Optimus Prime. That's a transformer. We're doing a transformation. <laughs> OK. Once we've done a filter operation, notice that we have a lot less data. We may wish to coalesce our data into smaller partitions so that our jobs don't finish so fast, our, our individual tasks don't finish so fast. The more partitions, the more tasks. This is a good thing. It's more parallelism. But if you have too many partitions and your individual tasks are finishing in a matter of milliseconds, at that point, your scheduling delay can become significant. So generally speaking, more partitions is more parallelism is better. Until your tasks are so fast that the scheduling overhead starts to become significant. So you want your task to finish in half a second rather than a few milliseconds. So we might reduce the total number of partitions with a coalesce operation. And then at some point, we call what's known as an action. How many of you guys are familiar with the streaming API in Java 8? So you guys are familiar, you're building up a pipeline, but nothing runs until you actually call an action, a terminal operation in those Java 8 pipelines. We're doing the same thing here in Spark. We've really created a stream of operations, but nothing is going to run until we call this terminal operation here called an action. And what the collect operation says is take those results, bring them back into memory in the driver. This is one possible action. Other actions might be save it to disk in HDFS. But bring it back into memory in the driver. Now, let me ask you, if I had six terabytes of data in memory, and my driver's got three gigs of RAM, what's going to happen? I get a nice big out of memory error. This is because with collect, I'm saying bring this back in as an array in memory. So typically, you're only going to call collect if the results are small. Otherwise, you want to save it out to a file somewhere. Or continue to do other operations, sum up the values, do some type of reduce operation, et cetera. Now, let's look at how this thing runs. When I call an action, only then does anything run. And if you start reading the documentation for Spark, you'll hear this phrase lineage or DAG. You execute the DAG or materialize the RDD. What they mean is this pipeline that we've been defining, which forms a directed acyclic graph. In other words, everything flows downstream. There are no circles. And you run it to get the result. So it's going to execute the DAG when we call an action and not before. So at that point, it's going to go out, read the file, do the filter, do the coalesce. So here we go. We're going to read the file, do the filter, do the coalesce, bring the data back into the driver. And when we're done, it releases all that memory. It's just run a job. It brought it into memory. Here's what's different than with Hadoop. All of the communication between these stages is in memory. Nothing gets written out to disk until I call an action that says write to disk. In this case, I didn't even bother writing to disk. I said bring it back to the driver. But I could say save as text file and write it out to HDFS. So all of these intermediate operations are happening in memory. And then you say, but Doug. What happens if a computer fails? Do I lose my work? Well, with Spark, what will happen is, let's say the computer that's executing this part of the pipeline here. Let me run a little arrow program. If the computer running this part of the pipeline 
were to suddenly crash. And actually, in this particular case, because of the coalesce, that whole thing there is going to be one task in my pipeline. And the computer running this task were to crash. No big deal. If the computer running this task crashes, the driver knows, well, this task was running on this input data set. Let me go ahead and start this up on another executor in my cluster when one becomes available. Or maybe one executor is just taking a really long time and Spark has no idea if it's hung or not. It'll speculatively re-execute that task on another executor and wait for the first one to finish. And in this way, we get resilience while still getting the high performance benefit of being in memory. And when we're done, the memory is released. Now, you say, wait a minute, what if I didn't want that memory released? What if I'm going to call a count action? But I also want to save it as a text file. And maybe I want to do a filter and collect that result. Well, if I don't tell it to cache, what's going to happen is it's going to load this data and do the count, release the memory. Load this data, save it to a text file, release the memory. Load this data, do a collect, and release the memory. Well, clearly, this is undesirable. We'd like to get a long-lived benefit in memory. So we have the option of telling it to cache by calling the cache operation to cache this result long-term in memory. So if I cache this in memory by calling the cache operation, then I get the benefit of not even having to go back to the original data source. Now you want to be careful when you cache things. When you cache things in Spark, very, very important, don't cache the original data set. <laughs> cache as far downstream as possible. If you cache too much, you lose the benefit of caching. You really want to cache a small data set so that it fits mostly in memory. And so one of the biggest things we see when we do audits of production systems is that they didn't cache intelligently. They either cache too much or not at all. And of course, it really comes down to what's the series of jobs your application wants to send. And Spark has no way of knowing what future jobs are about to run. So this is why you as the programmer provide that insight by calling cache. The other thing you need to remember is to uncache it. And Cache is really a shortcut to persist to memory. So the opposite of cache in the API is called unpersist. Gets everybody the first time. They go, how do I uncache? The answer is, you call unpersist. Now I want to check in with my audience here. How are we doing in terms of hitting the sweet spot of your interest? Good? Want some coding? We want to see that coding. Excellent. So this is the picture that I wanted to show you. Now that we've done that, let's go ahead and do some coding and see Spark in action. So we're going to do, first of all, a really straightforward example based on the audience. And then later on, I'll point you to a more complex example you could explore on your own. But let's take a look at this power plant demo. So how many of you guys are familiar with what are called peaking power plants? All right, so California. In the middle of the day, it's really hot. And they need to turn on some additional power plants to meet peak demand based on the temperature, humidity, et cetera. They need to be able to anticipate how many of these plants to turn on. And more importantly, for each plant, how efficient are they going to be? Because outside temperature, if it's really hot out, the plants don't run as efficiently because their exhaust temperature is higher. Second law of thermodynamics. So what we have is a data set. We've got atmospheric temperature and centigrade, exhaust vacuum, atmospheric pressure, and relative humidity. And we've measured the output of all of these power plants. Based on today, we had these readings, and we got this output. Next hour, we had these readings, we got this output. 
And what we'd like to do is to predict the power efficiency tomorrow, given our prediction for the temperature and pressure and so forth. So step one, we do what's known as an extract, transform, and load operation. Step two, we're going to explore and visualize the data. And step three, we're going to do some machine learning. So let's jump in now to our demo. So right now, I am firing up Databricks. Oops. Databricks runs entirely in the cloud on Amazon EC2. I come into Databricks, and the first thing I want to do is I come here to clusters, and I say, you know what? I need a cluster to be able to run this job. So let's see here, QCon demo. And you know what? I'd like to have eight machines, and I'd like to be running Spark 1.5. And I'm going to use on-demand instances so that nothing gets killed in the middle of my presentation by Amazon. Click Confirm. And this is going to start launching inside of Amazon EC2. I could bring up 100, 200 node cluster. Now at this point, what I'd like to do is go into my workspace, QCon San Francisco 2015. And what I'm going to do is just make a clone so that you guys can still keep the original. Wait for that to finish cloning. There we go. And I'll go into the power plant. I've got an example here that I think is right for you guys with power plant. There's a more elaborate one where we're processing a much larger data set in Wikipedia. They're click stream data, trying to predict how many clicks they're going to get and detect anomalies, like big traffic on a day. Let's go into power plant for now. So step one, I need to do an extract, transform, and load operation. So let's see here. The very first thing I need to do is to open up our text file and read it. So I go spark context. I'd like to read a text file, please. In which text file? Well, I'll copy paste this path. Oops. Copy paste this path here. Oh, I do have text field. All right, text file. And we'll read in the text file. Let's see how our cluster's doing. All right, it's still launching. It'll let us know when our cluster's launching. It's bringing up an Amazon EC2 instance. And once we've read that text file, the very next thing we'd like to do is actually take a look at what's in this text file. So I'm going to go raw data, a raw text RDD dot take. And we'll read in just the first five rows of the file. Now Amazon's being a little bit slower today, so we're going to keep going and we'll come back and run it when we're ready. So to give you the spoiler of what we'll see, the first line of the file is comments about the headers. The next line of the file is a comma separated values file. So what I'd like to do is using RDD programming, I would like to extract all that information from the file into nice little Python objects that represent each data point. So what I'm going to do is I'll start with my raw text RDD, and I'd like to filter. In this case, I'm using the Python API. We could just as easily use the Scala API. I find that for people who don't know Scala, they prefer Python for the demos. The uh, WikiML, I've got solutions in both Python and Scala for anybody who'd like to see them. And what would I like to do? Well, I'd like to filter out, given a line, if the line starts with a AT, atmospheric temperature. That's the header line of my file that defines the columns. Let's see, it's still bringing up my Amazon EC2. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to filter out lines that start with atmospheric temperature. And then what I'd like to do is for each line, split it up by commas, turn them into numbers, and place them in my Python object. So I'm going to want to do a map operation, convert line to row, or line to power plant row. And finally, that gives me back my RDD. So what I'm missing at this moment, and let's go ahead and print that, raw data rdd.take5. Now we need to make this function, convert line to RDD. This is standard functional programming. 
I'll go ahead and define it here in Python. Convert line to row. So given a text line, I want to return a new power plant row. So line.split. Based in this case, they're, they're actually not comma separated values, they're tab separated values. So we're going to split it up. So this is gives me my cells. And then let's see here, for each cell, I want to create a power plant row object. So power plant row cells zero. And I might want to, let's actually read this out. Atmospheric temperature is as a floating point number cell zero and so forth. Where do we got? Vacuum pressure, floating point, cells one. What else? Atmospheric pressure, floating point, cells two. Relative humidity, floating point, cells three. And finally, the power efficiency, floating point, cells four. And then I want to return a new row object. Return power plant row, which I defined right up above. Atmospheric temperature, vacuum pressure, atmospheric pressure, relative humidity, and power efficiency. Boy, Amazon is not being very friendly today. <laughs> not good for live demo. I should have fired this up five minutes before class. I thought, how cool would it be for you to see me fire it up? We're going to keep going just in the interest of time and then come back in and actually run it. So what we're doing is we're taking lines of text filtering out any line that starts with atmospheric temperature because it's a header label. We're then going to take the next line, split it up based on white space, convert them to numbers, and throw them into a Python object. Standard MapReduce functional programming for all of the Hadoop guys in here, right? Nothing unusual about this. And then we might take back the first lines and see how they look. Ah, here we go. My cluster is up. Run it. First time it's got to bring up some processes. Nothing like a live demo. Sure file. This particular file is not too huge. The, uh, the wiki ML, though, is, um, I believe, half a terabyte. And of course, the entire Wikipedia, which we do do in our labs and our training, is much, much larger. So here we go. Notice what I'm getting is a header separated by tabs, followed by a line that's a string of tab-separated values. But this is not very pretty. But I'm running in Python. So I can go lines and then go for line in lines, print line. There we go. Notice it formatted a little better because I'm still running and I got the full power of the Python programming language available to me, running in my shell. Can you guys see this OK? I can make my font a little bit bigger. So at this point, we've said we want to split this up and turn them into power plant row objects. So let's run this guy again. And ooh, we have a job failure. Does anybody see any spelling errors? I don't see one, so let's look at our error message. Come down here in the middle of our nice stack trace. That's one of the skills we have to teach in training is how to read these stack traces. And it says, error occurred while calling run job. Could not convert string to a floating point number, atmospheric temperature. So here's what I did wrong. Does anybody spot it? I filtered out lines that start with atmospheric temperature. Don't I want to filter lines that don't keep lines only that don't start with atmospheric temperature? So I did the exact opposite. To see that, let's just get rid of this map operation, run it again, and now the first five lines on my RDD were the headers. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go back and fix that. We're going to come here, and we want lines that do not start with atmospheric temperature. We're running again. There we go. Now we've got, in memory, Python objects that we can begin to process. Now, the trouble with Python objects, of course, is that we're stuck doing this MapReduce style of programming. So what we'd like to do 
I'll go into the uh, second stage here, is move beyond that style of programming and begin to use what are known as data frames. So let me reconnect my cluster, rerun the work we just did. And this time, I'd like to actually take a look at it. So I'm going to convert that RDD we just made called, what was it called? Uh, raw data RDD, raw data RDD. And I'll convert it to a data frame. And now, what I have at my disposal is the full power of a query engine that can run either SQL or programmatically written queries. So I can start saying, only give me things that were on days where the temperature was greater than 20 degrees. Let's try it. So I now have a power plant data frame. Now, the first thing I'll do is I'll want to register it here as a table. So I'll come down here and I'll say, power plant dot register as temp table and I'll call it power underscore plant. That registers it to my SQL binding and at this point I can start running queries like select star from power plant where atmospheric temperature is greater than 20 degrees. I could, of course, do an RDD filter operation, but this is much easier and more concise. Now, for those of you who don't like SQL, I can do the very same thing in Python. Power plant dot filter where the power plant atmospheric temperature is greater than 20 degrees. This is similar to something called pandas or SQL alchemy. I'm basically expressing my query. It's still a declarative query executed by the same query engine. But this time, I'm expressing my query in Python. And it still builds the same abstract syntax tree and runs it. But let's go ahead and display that. And again you see that I filtered out only jobs that have a high atmospheric temperature. Let's roll down a little further and get to even more interesting stuff. How am I on time, by the way? I've got about 10 minutes? 10 minutes. All right, so I'll fast forward just a little bit. I'll do one plot. So yes, I could describe the power plant table, for example. I want to get into the machine learning aspect. So we'll jump down a little bit. Let's say I wanted to visualize my data. I could do a scatter plot. So I could say select uh, PE as power and AT as temperature from power underscore plant. And I could actually change it to be a plot. You notice I've got a very strong linear relationship between the outside temperature and the power efficiency of our power plant. Let's go a little bit further. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit in the interest of time. So you'll notice that atmospheric temperature, let me zoom out a little bit, very nice line. Exhaust vacuum, a little bit less clear. There's something going on here. It's kind of linear, maybe not. This is the kind of analysis a really good data scientist would do be to try to convert this into a line by applying transformations. Then we look at something like atmospheric pressure. There's a semblance of a line, but a much weaker correlation. And then you get to something like relative humidity, and I have no idea what that's supposed to be. It's just a cloud. So relative humidity evidently has very little impact on the overall power efficiency of our power plant. 
So at this point, we're ready to actually start doing some machine learning. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and jump straight to my machine learning solution notebook instead of live coding. How many data scientists in here again? Just a small number of you guys. OK, so just kind of show you what you can do to get a real application out of this. So we finished visualizing our data. Let me do run all again. Notice the older version of the notebook had showed way fewer data points. They've now improved that to show a lot more data points, which is really neat. Go ahead and hit run all. And while we're running everything, I'm going to scroll down to linear regression. So what I'd like to do is to build a linear regression model of our data. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my original data set here and I'm going to split it up with an 80-20 split. I'm going to use 80% of those data points to do training, 20% then to do predictions, and then I'm going to evaluate how good are my predictions. It's a very common machine learning use case. And if I want my job to be reproducible, let's say an RDD partition goes down, and I do this random split over again, I would ideally like that partition to have the same data it had before. So one of the best practices is to give it a random seed, any seed at all, but a random seed so that it's deterministic in the event that something needed to rerun. So here I've given it a random seed. You'll also notice that I've asked it to cache the data frame in memory to allow my iterative algorithm to run faster. Now, one of the really amazing things about machine learning is that it benefits enormously from having our data in memory rather than on disk, because what machine learning is doing is iterating on this data over and over and over again, basically trying to find the perfect linear regression model. And in order to scale, it's doing this using what's known as gradient descent rather than an ordinary matrix multiplication in order to be able to scale to enormous amounts of data. So here we go. I'm going to say I want to make my predictions go in the predicted PE column. When I do my evaluations, I'm going to do training based on the original PE column. I'm going to allow my algorithm to iterate no more than 100 times. And the first thing I'm going to do is take my data frame and turn it into a mathematical vector. And then I'm going to run linear regression. And then I'm going to give it my training data. And out pops a model. Let's run this. Notice how quickly 15 jobs just ran in Spark. Because all that data is now cached in memory. You guys were all thinking, why is Spark going so slow when I was running stuff up above, weren't you? Tell me the truth. How many of you guys are going, why was it so slow? Answer, I hadn't cached. It was going back to HDFS each time. Or actually, in that case, Amazon EC2 S3 storage. This time, it's cached in memory. It ran 15 jobs like lightning. So 15 total iterations. I then can take my test data and get the predictions. And let's take a look at how we did. So I take my test data. I run predictions. And take a look. Some of them are quite close. Others, that's pretty close too. Here we go. This one's five away. This one's seven away. Not too bad. So a good data scientist would look to tweak their model to improve performance. But notice how fast and how easy it is to program on Spark using either Python or Scala. And then I could go even further. I can actually print out the equation that it learned. Y would be our power efficiency. And so it learned. I just multiply the atmospheric temperature by this, the vacuum pressure by this. Notice how little contribution vacuum pressure and other things have compared to atmospheric temperature. We come over to relative humidity. And it's got almost no contribution. No, here we go. What's this one? Has atmospheric pressure has almost no contribution at all. Now, part of that's because of its units. And then I could actually do some evaluations. I can do some nice visualizations. Scroll down a little bit. 
I can see, for example, that I get a nice bell curve on my error. This is excellent data result. And I could go even further and see how much of my data is one standard deviation, two standard deviations, or three standard deviations away from its prediction. So as a data scientist, I can very rapidly build and develop models. And I get much better performance and throughput than I would expect in Hadoop. So with that said, I'm going to wrap up and then take questions. So who are we again? The presentation is a joint sponsorship between Databricks and New Circle. Databricks has done about 75% of the commits on Spark because it's basically the original team at Berkeley that made Spark. So Spark is an enormous ecosystem, but a lot of the core talent driving Spark is at Databricks. New Circle is training partners with Databricks. We do training in Spark, Big Data, Android, Java, Python, and a whole host of other technologies. If you liked this style of learning through hands-on demonstration, really getting a sense of a mixture of the power of Spark, what's happening under the hood, and actual live coding, this is what we do in our training. It's three days of very intense hands-on. But hopefully, this has been a valuable experience for everybody here. Uh, thank you guys very, very much for attending. I can take other questions. Support for neural networks and deep machine learning. So there's a, a website called spark-packages.org where some people have tried to do deep machine learning with neural networks. Uh, and of course, you'll realize a, a simple neural network is just a, 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 well, a level one neural network is really just a simple linear regression. Uh, but once you add deep neural network chaining, that's when it becomes more advanced. Go to spark-packages.org. Anybody else? Yes. What happens if the driver crashes? So this is a great question, and the answer to that depends on how you've launched the driver. If it's a nightly job, for example, you can run the driver in what's known as supervised mode, where the yarn master or the standalone cluster master would detect that the driver failed and relaunch the driver and the entire application. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, if it's an interactive shell, you launch it. But yes, when the driver crashes, you lose your work, unfortunately, at this time. There is a technique known as checkpointing, where you actually checkpoint your work so that even if the driver were to crash, you can recover where you left off. And this is very commonly used in streaming scenarios. Question here. Not very difficult at all. So if you were to set up your own cluster, you can do that on what's known as uh, Spark standalone mode, which comes, it's called standalone because it comes with Spark. And you can quickly set up a cluster like right out of the box. If you just have a bunch of machines, you just launch the executors. You'd launch the driver and tell it you know, where the, actually the executors register back to the driver. So you launch the driver, then you launch the executors and tell them to register with the driver. Very easy. The, you can also actually run Spark on Yarn, in which case you're then using the Yarn master to do all of this work. But that takes a bit more work. So the nice thing about standalone is that it comes out of, without having to configure a third party product like Yarn. Question here, Peter, and then uh, Matt. So what we didn't get to go into as much detail. So the question was, what happens when Spark doesn't necessarily have reused data from the purposes of caching? So remember this picture that I showed much earlier. Let me bring it back up again. Uh, it's the RDD slides. This picture. Now, one thing that's actually happening in this picture that we didn't get to go into because of time constraints today is something known as pipelining. So what happens, see, in Hadoop, each of these individual stages would be their own process running and dumping to HDFS. What Spark is going to do is realize that all of these things could actually be done locally between each of these individual transformations. So it's going to read in a partition. In this case, let's say I had one executor. How would this run? It's going to read in, in this case, two blocks from HDFS, do the filters, do the coalesce, and then of course do the collect operation, and it's going to do that all in memory on one partition. Then it might fire off another task to work on the next two partitions, and so forth. So what actually happens is even if it doesn't cache in memory, you're getting the benefit of what's known as pipelining through this analytical model. You're also getting what are called shuffle files. So if you have a more elaborate operation where it's actually what's called a multi-stage operation, between each stage, it actually dumps out intermediate results to a file, which creates a second level of caching. Matt, I think I said first. Yep.
Ah, so Spark supports Python, Scala, R, and Java. And starting in 1.5, Java 8. So um, what you really want is to choose the language of your choice. Scala is actually your first choice. If you guys are good with Scala, you understand Scala, or you take a quick new circle class on Scala, the major the, all of the APIs available in Scala, Spark is written on Scala. With that said, maybe you guys are a Java shop. You can use Java. Now, I discourage you using Java 7 because it's very verbose with inner classes. You really want lambdas. And then we find the machine learning community is more comfortable with R and Python, so we teach it in R and Python for that type of audience. Does that answer your question? Eric, and how is optimized is it from pulling from a SQL source? So that's a great question, and there's two optimizations that you want to be aware of. One of them is if I'm doing a data frame query, and let's say I do a filter with my data frame, and it looks and goes, you know what? I could do that filter in, my, in Oracle itself. Or maybe I'm doing a join, but it looks and says, I'm joining two tables from Oracle. It pushes the join and filter into Oracle first. Second, it can actually create parallel JDBC readers. So if it's a sorted data set, you could actually say, give me the first thousand to this partition, the second thousand to this partition, and then the individual executors are running in parallel. But of course, your Oracle database under the hood needs to be able to support that level of parallelism. So usually we only do that when we're running in something like Amazon Redshift, where you can handle concurrent queries. So what do you have to do with Spark from a management perspective? And then you specifically mentioned business intelligence. So if you're a team that's doing exploratory data analysis and business intelligence, skip RDDs outright. Go straight to data frames. RDDs are going to be your fallback. Data frames are the preferred way to go. If you can use data frames, use them. RDDs are for only things you can't do with data frames. Um, and then it's going to be as straightforward as using SQL. Now, from a management perspective, what do you need? Um, well, you want to make sure that A, you know how to set up your Spark cluster. So there's a skill set there. B, um, your team, are they familiar with what language? R or Python or what? Python, Java, and C Sharp. So you would choose whether you want to use Java 8, I don't recommend Java 7, or preferably Python for that team if they're very fluent in that. And then just sign up. We have a one-day Spark overview, and we have a three-day Spark developer. We're also starting out to write a class specifically for exploratory data analysis and BI, which would go into less into the programming side and more into doing visualizations and SQL queries. The BI guys can do it, as long as they can write SQL. They have to be able to write SQL. That's the one caveat. Now, you can also make Spark a JDBC provider. So your existing Tableau tools could connect to Spark as a JDBC provider, in which case Spark is running the JDBC, but not now you're actually running your familiar tools and still connecting to Spark. Oh, absolutely would take advantage of the parallelism. The Spark SQL execution engine will take care of the parallelism. Thanks, guys, very much uh, for coming. I know there's food out there. I'll take a few more questions. You're welcome to come forward and ask.